Hey everyone, uh, my name is Vincent and I'm working uh, on my PhD program at Institute for Shock Physics with uh, Dr. Prakash being my advisor and uh, my my project is a material in uh, mechanical extremes, shock, the shock behavior of tungsten based CIRMAS 200 GPA. Uh, for those of you who isn't familiar with the uh, the term CIRMAS, it's just a combination of ceramics and metals and you will see in a bit why uh, we have this term in my, my research. Uh, oops. Uh, so, uh, due to the uh, time limit, this is just going to be a very high level summary of what we have, uh, uh, what we have investigated, uh, investigated so far. And uh, if you're really interested in uh, my presentation, please check it out, uh, our, our main publications, which talks about the methodology and uh, data analysis and discussion in very detail. Um, so the objective of my, uh, of our, our research is to understand the shock behavior of uh, cobalt-based uh, cemented tungsten carbide subject to shock loading up to 100 GPA. That includes uh, determining the immaterial properties such as the pressure, the particle velocity, density, compression, and uh, uh, the longitudinal stress in both the elastic limit and the uh, at the uh, peak state. We're also interested in determining the Hogonio relationships, uh, including the shock speed versus particle velocity, and uh, as well as in uh, longitudinal stress versus volumetric compression. The last two are related to the uh, uh, to quantifying the state of damage caused by the shock loading inside the cemented tungsten carbide. Um, so this, uh, this is a diagram demonstrating the uh, planar shock wave propagating inside the material. So uh, this type of planar uh, shock front is, uh, is usually generated by, a, by an impact between two flat surfaces. As the shock front is propagating through the material with a, a velocity d, it's going to change the states of the material um, from its original state to, uh, to an elevated state. Uh, those states in, including the pressure, density, and particle velocity, etc. Uh, so these are the states I just mentioned above, and they they can be related together by what is called the rank Hogonio jump relationships. So these three equations are derived from the balance of mass, balance of linear momentum, and balance of energy. So the quantities with subscript zero are the one ahead of the shock front, which corresponds to the state that is in uh, ahead of the shock front. So they are generally known because they are in the original states so undisturbed. Um, the, the five unknown quantities, uh, which is the density, particle velocity, pressure, internal energy, as well as the shock speed, are uh, 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 they, they are unknown, but we only have three equations. Uh, what we typically do is that the particle velocity after the shock front as well as the shock speed can be measured during an impact velocity. So that leaves us only three on those. And with those three equations, we can solve for everything. One thing to note here, it, it is very important that if a shock front uh, is, a, is not a singular, it's structured, which means the shock front has a finite thickness. It is very important to note that the three equations in rankine hogonio jump relationships are valid only if the shock front has a, a constant velocity. Uh, so the materials that we're studying is cemented tungsten carbide with cobalt binder. The, uh, there are two grades of uh, tungsten carbide that we're studying. One contains 3.7% cobalt by weight uh, also referred to as GC103, and the other one is uh, GC206, which contains 6% of cobalt uh, by weight. These 
two grades are manufactured by powder metallurgy, which means they are uh, the pure tungsten carbide powders are mixed with the cobalt binder, uh, uh, and then then compacted in the dye and sintered in the furnace. They were obtained from uh, a manufacturer called General Car Carbide. Uh, so this diagram demonstrate the uh, uh, the first set of experiments that we did. It's called the transmission experiments. In plain English, it just means that we're going to send uh, we're, we're going to send a shock wave into the tungsten carbide sample. So what happened? So what is happening? here is that if the impactor is bonded to a projectile, uh, depending on what velocity that we're going to impact at, it's the projectile as well as the impactor will be fired using either a gas gun or a powder gun. So I'm sorry the uh, maximum velocity is uh, uh, cut off here, but for the gas gun, the maximum impact velocity will be one uh, around one kilometer per second. For the powder gun, it's around 2.7 kilometer per second. So that means they can uh, uh, it can achieve much more or uh, much higher stress using the powder gun. Once the impactor hits the buffer plate, which shown in blue, it's going to create uh, such a plane waves into the buffer. As the shock wave propagates through the buffer, it's going to transmit into the sample. So, uh, when the shock wave reaches the back surfaces of the buffer and the sample, it's going to uh, so the the back surfaces of those two uh, of those two plates will have a have a velocity, and those velocities will be measured using laser interferometry. In, in this case, it's uh, it's visor. So the difference in signal arrival time between uh, those two different plates will give us the time that the shock wave uh, travels uh, through the sample. Knowing the thickness of the sample, we can determine the shock speed uh, in, inside, inside a sample. So this is, uh, in, in the picture, the red curve is what the, uh, the, the surface velocity profile looked like for a, a for tungsten carbide. Uh, it's typically, it's, it's going to be a structured wave. The first uh, the first small jump corresponds to the elastic wave. Following that, it's a it's a it's a ramp, and uh, it's related to the hardening process. And uh, uh, following the uh, ramp, it's going to be a larger jump that corresponds to the propagation of the plastic wave. In the analysis, the measured uh, shock wave profile will be idealized as a simple two-wave structure, which is represented by the black dashed line. It's just a pure elastic wave and a pure plastic wave. And also the materials are considered to be a perfectly elastic plastic and rate independent solid. Uh, for, for, this, for, for this part of the analysis, after the plateau will be the release process, and that is not considered in, in this part. So uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's, uh, we have to make sure that for structured wave, the shock speed is constant throughout the sample. That's why we did uh, some experiments at different stresses with different. Uh, so so we did some of the uh, experiments with thicker sample at different stress levels. You can uh, and the uh, time coordinates is uh, normalized by the sample thickness. And uh, as you can see, the shock profile, uh, like they, they lie on top of each other. That means the shock speed is, uh, remains constant through the different propagation distance. So that means the rank angonial jump relationships are valid for this material that we're investigating. Uh, there are 16 plate impact experiments that we did in total. So. Uh, Eight for each, uh, eight, eight for each grade, and the impact velocity ranges from around 0.5 to 2.7 kilometer per second, and the measured shock speed ranges from somewhere around 5.7 to 6.5 kilometer per second. 
uh, to get the material uh, quantities in the shock state as well as the elastic limit, we use what is called the impedance matching technique. Uh, coupled with the rankine hogonio jump relationships, we get the stress at the elastic limit for those <coughs> two different grades, R4.45 uh, for grade 103 and uh, 3.72 for grade 206. It is with an expectation that the stress at the elastic limit for the 206 is lower than that for 103 because it, uh, considering it's higher cobalt, uh, cobalt content. And the peak stress is uh, for, for both grade ranges from somewhere around 9 to almost 100 GPA. Uh, what is always uh, like what is being uh, widely discussed about in the uh, field of shock physics is the USUP relationship, which is the shock speed versus particle, uh, particle velocity uh, speed. Empirically, empirically, for most uh, materials, especially for soft materials, it's going to be a straight line in this diagram, which means the shock speed increases linearly with particle velocity. However, in our case, we have, seen, uh, we have seen this feature. The red and the blue symbols represent those two grades that we're investigating. So we can see it's decreasing first, and then it starts to increase. Also, from the open literature, we have found the similar behavior for tungsten carbide, uh, cemented tungsten carbide containing 5% of cobalt binder, as well as the pure tungsten carbide. Um, what is happening here is that because the tungsten carbide sample uh, still has uh, a significant amount of strength, so if the shock, uh, so if the stress caused by the shock is is uh, low to intermediate level, the shock behavior of, the, of this material will be governed by not only the uh, the stress, it's all also governed by the, the strength of the material. So if you continue uh, increasing the stress or the amplitude of the shock, you will see that uh, on the top right of the, of the figure, you can see some points will lie uh, on a straight line. We call that to be hydrodynamic, which basically means that the stress caused by the shock is so much higher than the strength of the material, that uh, the material behaves as if it has no strength. So it behaves like, like a fluid. That's why we call it hydrodynamic. The hydrodynamic pressure can be expressed using that equation uh, with a small p. In that equation, the C0 term and the S term corresponds to the, uh, corresponds to the uh, constants uh, you, you will see in the linear USUP relationship. And in this figure, you can see that for both uh, for, for both grades in our in our in our study, the red symbol and the blue symbol, they lie above the hydrodynamic pressure. Uh, for for peak stresses lower than 70 GPA. So the difference so the difference between the longitudinal stress. Which, uh, which is represented by the symbol, and the hydrodynamic pressure, which is represented by the curve, can be used to determine the shear stress carried by the sample. So what this figure is saying that if the stress at the peaks, uh, if the stress at peak state is lower than around 70 GPA, the material still carries uh, some amount of shear stress, but when it's going to go higher, let's say around 80 GPA. The symbols fall on the respective uh, hydrodynamic curve, which means at this point, there's no shear stress carried by the sample. Uh, one thing to note here is that the black triangle there corresponds to the pure tungsten carbide, and uh, they, they are larger than the uh, hydrodynamic curve throughout the range, uh, throughout the stress range, which means even if uh, if they've shot to up to 80 GPA, the pure tungsten carbide still carries uh, some amount of shear stress, which means that it can, it can have some strength 
at very much high, uh, high stresses. So this is just uh, another, uh, another plot emphasizing, uh, emphasizing the shear stress carried by the sample. It's just like a, uh, projecting the previous data to this plane. The, this y-axis is the shear stress, and the x-axis is the mean stress, which is basically another uh, term for the hydrodynamic pressure. You can see that for, uh, for both of our uh, constant carbide samples, as well as the hollow uh, black symbol, which is the cement constant carbide containing 5% of cobalt, it carries almost no shear stress when, um, when shocked to over 80 GPA. On the other hand, the pure constant carbide, which is the black diamond, it's, it's the shear stress keeps going. So it's, a, it's another uh, evidence that Ertelsen carbide has strength up to that stress level. The next set of experiments that we have did is the sound speed measurement. Uh, the sound speed measurement has been widely used in the community of shock physics, uh, mostly for investigating the solid liquid or solid solid phase, trans uh, phase transition. For example, if you shock, uh, let's say, silver metal to very high stresses, the stress will simply melt the silver to liquid. And uh, the sound speed is uh, generally higher than solid than it is in the liquid. So what you will see, so if you measure the sound speed in the uh, silver, what you will see is that there will be a drop at that particular stress level, which is an evidence of melting of the silver. Here, we don't expect such uh, melting or any phase transition in our uh, sample, but still we can use that to uh, have some other, to gain some other useful information. The, the one, the, the information that we're going to get is the elastic moduli, uh, both longitudinal and shear moduli. So if we compare the experimentally obtained longitudinal and shear moduli uh, to the theoretical, to, to the one, for, to, to the values obtained from theoretical models, assuming no damage in it. So we can say, uh, so, so we can quantify the state of damage using these two values. As I've uh, mentioned earlier, there, there will be some damage uh, caused inside the material once it's shocked to very high stresses. So the CLE and the CBE will just uh, sound speed. The CLE is a measured longitudinal sound speed and the CBE is the estimated bulk sound speed uh, using the uh, isentropic bulk modulus. So, in this set of experiments, we used two uh, different configurations. Uh, one is called the front surface impact, and the other one is called the release wave overtake experiments. Um, I don't think I've, I have time to go over these two experiment configurations in detail, but uh, long story short, we did uh, seven experiments using these two uh, configurations to at relatively low stress level uh, using the front surface impact and five at intermediate to high level of stress using the release wave overtake experiment. And this is the part of, uh, this is the uh, interface velocity uh, profile that we obtained using these two configurations. The left one is the one from front surface impact and there, the one on the right is the one obtained using release wave overtake. The black arrows in those figures indicating the arrival of the release wave the re, uh, which travels in the sample at the sound speed. So with that we, we can calculate what the sound speed is in uh, inside a sample at a given uh, shocked state. And the results are shown here. The red symbols corresponds to the measured uh, sound speed at different shock stresses. Uh, the one on the left 
is uh, is from from surface impact, and the one on the right uh, is the one uh, obtained in the overtake experiments. The blue symbols corresponds to the theoretical uh, bulk sound speed. Those are obtained using uh, using a third order birch monahan equation state. With these two quantities, we can calculate both longitudinal sound speed and the shear. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, we can calculate both longitudinal modulus and shear modulus. So the moduli are calculated here. The one on the left is the uh, longitudinal modulus, and the one on the right is the shear modulus. In, uh, personally, in my opinion, I think that the shear modulus plot has more information. Uh, it's more informative because if you if you take a look at the uh, the different symbols, first of all, uh, the blue and the black hollow symbols corresponds to the theoretical value obtained using the uh, steinberg a model. There there are two because uh, there there are temperature effect and without temperature effect. And since since the temperature rise in our uh, in, in the stress range that we're interested in is very small, so the temperature effect is minor. Um, there, there is no damage assumed in this uh, theoretical steinberg gwinnett model, so it's just uh, uh, pressure dependent, so it keeps increasing. However, in our from our results, we can see that for uh, the red symbol are well below the theoretical model on, on the far right because there's damage, uh, there, there's some internal damage caused by the shock. Uh, so that, that's why that's why considering that it's it's much lower than the theoretical uh, theoretical values. What is interesting though is is the is a few uh, points on the left. It's 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 higher than the than the value predicted by the theoretical value, and we think that it is because the, the because the collapse of the voids and the consolidation of the microstructure of the cement constant carbide. Because if you take a, a microscopic image, you can see some voids in there, and uh, for for some for low to intermediate uh, level of shock compression, it's it's going to be there, there will be a consolidation process within uh, within the material, so it increases the shear modulus, and that is not captured by the theoretical um, steinberg winner model. And I think that's pretty interesting. So that pretty much summarizes the uh, the work that we have accomplished so far. The next uh, phase will be investigating the dynamic strength of cement carbide using what is called a self-consistent technique and uh, and we're going to also do some computational uh, modeling to to back up our theory so yeah that's that's all my presentation thank you